have you ever noticed that your hi-fi sounds much better late at night, in the wee small hours of the morning? This is a phenomenon which is often discussed by people, and it's always attributed to mains noise going down. However, we've done extensive measurements of this and find there's very, very little difference in the mains, but with microphones that we use for our speaker measurements, we've noticed that late at night there's very little noise, but in the day there's quite a lot of noise, and this noise is, is traffic, underground pumps, by um, water going over weirs, by the tide, and it is, there are myriad sources of noise. And people have often commented that if the power ever goes off and you've got a blackout, it is extremely quiet. And people say it's eerily quiet. It tells us that there's an awful lot of noise coming in from vibration. The noise is insidious. It varies a huge amount by 20 to 40 dB we've measured. I have here a slide that we can show which shows you a readout. This is a, a seismograph plot which has come from the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network where they're discussing the various sources of vibration. Now, we've all seen these traces and these are the little jiggles that the pen makes on the seismograph. Here's a small earthquake, these ones here. But then they're discussing the effect of the wind and you can see here no wind and the wind, and they, they're three to four times louder, and then when the wind, wind subsides, these micro-vibrations become less. Now, these micro-vibrations are the enemy of your hi-fi, and you'll say, well, how does it affect my hi-fi? Well, there's a, um, a, a number of mechanisms that these vibrations can get into your house. So if you look at the next slide, we can see here is a representation of a house. And we have traffic giving the noise, which can go through the structure into your hi-fi. We've got your fridge, we've got the washing machine, you've got the wind around the trees, myriad sources of vibration. All of these are vibrating your speakers and your hi-fi equipment rack. And what we found is that these vibrations degrade the sound, and the degradation is far higher than a lot of people would be led to believe. Now, Okay, these vibrations, we've, put some num we've got some numbers on these, and it, it's typically about one micron to about 10 for when it's noisy. Uh, how does this affect our hi-fi? Well, if you've got a valve amplifier, it's got the grids in it, which are the electrodes that control the flow of electrons from the cathode to the anode. And sl slight voltage change on the grid changes the uh, flow of electrons, but if there's any vibration on the grid, it will modulate the sound with that vibration and put a noise on it. And you know that this because if you tap a, a valve with your fingers, there's a little ringing sound that you can hear that uh, shows you that it's sensitive to vibration. The next product, of course, is record players. Now, record players are vibration sensitive because they're basically a vibration device. You've got the needle in the groove vibrating backwards and forwards, producing the sound. Now, if you hold a record up to the light and look at the, lo the light on it, you can see some rainbow colours in there, which tells us that the modulations in that groove are right down in the micron range, uh, with the wavelength of light going between sort of four and about seven and a half microns. And you've got the noise impinged on that record, vibrating backwards and forwards between one and 10 microns. So you can see that the noise is a significant part of the, the music you're trying to replay. So record players are sensitive to vibration. Then we've got um, CD players, streamers, and any digital device which contains a crystal oscillator. Now, a crystal oscillator is a little piece of quartz with some metal vape uh, deposited on each side. And as electric current is flowing through it, and the current is made to cause the crystal to vibrate due to piecemeal electric effects. And they vibrate at around 27 million times a second. And that is a vibration that is very, very accurate, setting the timing. If there's vibration coming onto that crystal, it will vary the frequency. Now, this is very, very uh, well-known phenomenon in m military communications especially. And the, uh, the, the vibration 
can come, especially if it's a, a backpack uh, from a, a foot soldier or if it's on a, a tank or if it's on a plane or if it's on a warship, the vibrations getting through to the crystals make, can absolutely destroy communication. You cannot communicate because of the vibration. So they go to great lengths to isolate the crystals in these situations, but it's very much the same with a, uh, any, any digital device which has got a crystal in it. So we've got any disc, silver disc player, a DAC, a streamer, a computer. They've all got these crystal oscillators in. Now, if you put noise onto them, like vibration, it will vary the frequency of the crystal. And that is commonly called jitter. And if you put jitter into a digital system, it really degrades the sound. So you've got to get the jitter right down so it's imperative to prevent vibration getting to a CD player or any crystal device. Then power amplifiers, pre-amplifiers, any transistor amplifying device is also susceptible to a degree to external vibration because you've got ceramic uh, components which are pizzo electric. You've got problems with wires vibrating can cause an electric field, uh, it is sensitive to vibration. And then the big one that people completely ignore are the loudspeakers. And the speakers are very sensitive to vibration because these, let's say called the, the, the residual one micron vibration, a, a five kilohertz tone on a diaphragm about this big, five inch, four inch, playing at about 35 dB at about 5 kilohertz is moving only at about one hundredth of a micron. So you've got one micron vibrations on top of one hundredth of a micron vibrations in, it's probably the decay of an organ note or a piano note, but a soft bit where the, it, you get the room acoustic is, con, is contained in these low volume notes. If you take the vibration away from the speaker, it suddenly becomes clear and depth, space, clarity all improve. So we've got this big problem, how do we do this? Most speakers are held on spikes and the idea of the spikes is to say we hold the speaker to the floor and we drain the energy away and we spike our equipment racks, we spike our, all the equipment is all on spikes, they're very popular. But there's a problem with that. The spikes, are, they say they go one way because they point in the direction of down like a, an arrow, sending the vibration this way, but they are just as good at sending vibration up as down. They're equal. There's no selectivity in the directionality of a spike. So the, the other devices we use, uh, we've put, we put sorbethane in between, which is advantageous, it gets rid of some vibration. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is to show a, a graphical representation of this isolation phenomenon. And how we describe it in engineering terms is with the transmissibility graph. And here you can see transmissibility of one. And it's basically a line here. Now, if you've got an item sitting on the table, the table and the item sitting on it move as one. And this is, the, as the table goes up and down, the, the, the object goes up and down. And that's re represented by this straight line. So if we um, want to isolate this item from what's happening on the ground, we put a bit of stuff in between. So let me take a piece of stuff here, this brochure, and put it down there. Now we put this on there. And we've changed the situation. Now, the vibration in this could either be more, equal, or less. So if it was more, then you've got something for nothing, which means you've solved the energy crisis, and I wouldn't be doing this business. I'd be making millions and putting Shell and BP out of business. So we can dismiss that because it just can't happen. The next possibility is the vibration is the same. Now, the chances of that are one, are one in a million because you've changed something. It's no longer the same situation, so there's going to be... S the third possibility is less vibration. Now, if we're trying to get rid of all the vibration, the less vibration we can get through, the better. 
Now, if we go back to this graph and have a look, you, we can see here that our spikes will give us a little bit of isolation here, shown by these little black areas. If we use sorbethane, you get some more isolation, you know, where this is frequency, this is the range, frequency range over the, where it affects audio, and that goes down to about 5 hertz, where it's uh, a problem for audio. Um, elastomers, what, squash balls, similar up here, and it's a win, some lose some. They, some people think it's great, some people don't, because it, it, it's neither one thing nor the other. So what we've really got to do is to have isolation like this. So how do we achieve isolation of that quality? What we've got to do is to make a, what we call a low pass filter. Now, to demonstrate the low pass filter, we have this very, very high tech experiment here, which comprises a pink elephant on a spring, okay? Now, if I hold this steady and stop him bouncing, I can move my hand up and down slowly and the elephant will follow my hand. Now this is a transmissibility of one. What my hand does, the elephant does. Okay, but if I increase the frequency of the oscillation, you can see I get to a resonance point where a little tiny input gives a huge output where the elephant is bouncing really, really quite a lot. But then if I go up in frequency with my hand to here, a very high frequency, you can see there the elephant is holding still and my hand is going up and down quite fast. And that is the principle of the mechanical low pass filter. So if we go back to this slide here, we can see down here is the transmissibility of one, where it's one to one with the movement of the elephant, up and down with the hand. Then you get the resonance here, and then above resonance, you can see there's isolation. So the principle that we employ is to have a mass and a spring. Now, we have a few uh, devices here which illustrate this. And here's a little experiment that we can show, which um, I'll just blank that. If we take this piece here, and here we have some pretty standard springs. And what I'm going to do is to put a spring under each corner of this here. Okay. Now we have our elephant on the spring. And you can see here, it's bouncing up and down at about two hertz, because there's not a lot of weight on this. But this is isolating extremely effectively from the table to the equipment suspended on the table. But this is not a very, very good situation. So what we have to do is to modify the basic spring and make a device like this, where we have the spring and a damper. Now you can see here, these springs in here are the same as the springs in there, but we have the rubber boot over the spring. You can see if I take one of these pieces here, it has the spring with a, uh, uh, basically a rubber bellows over it, and then we put a little small hole in there. Uh, now, if you move this up and down like that, it's very much the same as this. But if I seal this and push this up and down, there's air going through that hole, and that resistance of the air damps this movement down. So you can see this is still vibrating, but this one stops very, very quickly. Yeah? Because of this damping, because of this, this spring. However, when this is at rest, the air goes in and out of the hole without any resistance at all, and the isolation of this for micro vibrations is the same as the vibration here. But if you disturb this one, 
it bounces like crazy. If you disturb this one, it rapidly settles. And this is far more desirable than that. Now, we have these available as a product that we sell, and we have this little pod, which is available with springs going from, we have springs for one kilo, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and 64 kilos, uh, which is about two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128 pounds. Uh, we have these in sets of four usually that you put underneath. They have a height adjustment on them. Then we have uh, this, which is our famous seismic sink in its latest incarnation, where we have a, uh, a rigid steel plate with another, a further steel plate below. But in between, we have constrained layer damping to absorb any local vibration that may be in, this, in the, uh, the top plate. Now, if, if we tap that, you can see it's quite dead. We're here. That's quite, quite noisy. So that is, not, that is undesirable. This is highly desirable. And this is very good for putting uh, turntables, uh, amplifiers, all source components, uh, especially digital components. And one reviewer remarked recently that the latest and greatest streamer from a very popular company, when placed on the seismic sink, improved it out of sight because of the vibration has been taken away from the crystal oscillator. Uh, so it's, you can see here that it's very important to isolate all your basic amplifier and source components. Right, now we need to talk about the situation with speakers. And with speakers, we've got a number of problems. There's a, the very, very small vibrations and the very, very large vibrations. So what we're doing here is we're going to move this away and take these springs away from here. And we're simulating a loudspeaker with this. And this is on spikes. Here there's four spikes. And this is rigidly connected to the, the table. And this here is an isolated speaker. Now, these two little electric motors have been arranged to represent the loudspeaker cone, and this is the speaker, and this is the base. Now, we're, we've used a thin piece of wood here to e exaggerate the situation that the cabinet is not rigid, that the cabinets can bend. They're made of wood, mostly, and also the floor can have a bit of give in it, so that what we, can, we get is a, a situation where we have a, uh, uh, what, what is supposed to be rigid spiked to the floor. When we put a signal on, and how we do the signal in this instance, what we're doing is we're going to connect these to the power supply here. This is a little, okay, and we're going to, Put, get the motor to run and show what happens as we increase the speed and change the frequency. Now you can see there quite a lot of vibration. Now that is what is called resonance. Whereas, it, and if we go faster, it gets less and less and less. You see there? So if I drop the frequency, you can see there that there's severe resonance. You can even see that it's shaking the whole table and the lamp is moving and this is moving in synchronism with it, in sympathy. And this is the situation you have with the speaker that's spiked to the floor when you're playing powerful bass notes. Uh, as you go up in frequency, you can see that it vibrates a bit and then, then as we go further and further and further, you can see that there's another resonance there with a bit of excess vibration. Now here, we have exactly the same motor arrangement, same base, but this time we have it isolated with our damped springs. Now we will do the same drive here. Yes, there's a little bit of movement there, but that's very, very low frequency, extremely low. And as we go up to the there's a bit of movement, but you can see it is vibrating, but no frequency is being 
amplified. There's no resonance behavior showing there. And we go right fast and go down slow. You can see this, it just is naturally following the movement. Now if we plug this one in and do the two together and see here, Look at the difference between this one and that one. And this is the rigidly spiked one with the resonant behavior showing. Here, it's virtually stationary. And as we go up in frequency, you can see this is going through its various resonance modes, where this one is just vibrating in sympathy all the way up. And there's another one there, which this... But this one is actually affecting that one because they're similar, similarly co they're connected in the same, because it's shaking the base, and you can see that it's, once again, okay. This one is shaking the table, which is, f funnily enough, shaking that one. So, the idea of spikes being on speakers to hold them still is not taking into account the fact that the speaker can be slightly uh, bendy uh, and flexible and springy, which it is, and the floor can be slightly springy and flexible. So instead of having the perfect rigid speaker, you've got a situation where you've got amplified resonances plus transmission to the floor. Now this vibration from a speaker will go into the floor and go to the neighbours and the neighbours will be able to hear, hear your sound and you will also get sound from the floor to yourself. So you will actually hear the floor taking off, accentuating the bass. And this is one of the uh, major problems of woolly, fluffy, heavy, thumpy bass. Now we do occasionally get a criticism when people use this situation and, and we take away this extra bass which is radiating from the floor and also those resonances are gone. I say, oh, I've lost all the bass. Oh, I fall in love with that bass. I love it. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yes, the mid-band's better, the treble's better, the stage is better, everything sounds better, but oh, I've lost my bass. Well, what you're really hearing, though, is the true bass of your speaker system. And quite often people move their speakers forward out of the, away from the corners to get rid of the corner amplification plus the floor vibration. So if you take the floor vibration away, you can move your speakers back into the corners where you can get a larger stereo sound stage without the boom because you're not setting off the room and you'll get the corner amplification to make up for the loss of thump that comes out of the floor. And when you do this, you suddenly realize that you've got another experience with a far more open sound, far clearer, far better treble, far better defined notes, uh, bowed instruments which are connected to the floor and the, they do that to sound, make the floor a sounding board but the last thing you want is your speaker becoming an instrument as part of the music. We can demonstrate the way it con communicates to the floor uh, the speaker can communicate with the floor by a tuning fork here. Now if we take this tuning fork and put it on, the, you can't hear much there but if we put it on the table You can hear the table amplifies the vibration. Now you can hear nothing. And the reason for that is that these vibrations are being transmitted through to the table and the table is then making, is acting as a large speaker cone or speaker. Whereas when you isolate, you stop that, the floor radiating and the last thing you want is the floor radiating because it's highly distorted. So, we can see that if you float your whole hi-fi system, you, first of all you're cutting the vibrations getting in, and then with the speaker you're cutting the vibration from the speaker going to the floor, and of course back to your hi-fi, because the two can interact, and you've got the speakers shaking your hi-fi and shaking the floor. Float everything, and the result is magic. <laughs>